I don't like completing games. I used to. For a few years in the early 2010s, god that makes me sound old, I put a lot of time into achievement and trophy hunting. And to clarify, that's what I mean when I say completing a game. Getting all the trophies or achievements. I completed stuff largely for one of two reasons. The first being that I enjoyed playing a game so much that I wanted to stay in that world for as long as I could, and working through the achievement list got me to do just that. And the second being that when I finished a game, I had a pretty high percentage of trophies done, so I figured I'd just knock the rest out. With nearly every game I completed though, by the time I was done with it, I kind of hated it. The process of 100%ing a title left a bad taste in my mouth. And despite how much I may have loved a game, it's become impossible to not look back without some frustration. The best memories of them faded away and were replaced with the most mundane and tedious bits of gameplay. Whether it be getting all the feathers in Assassin's Creed 2, or waiting in empty lobbies so I could complete the co-op missions in Far Cry 3, or grinding out play after play, trying to stay in the pocket for 10 seconds in Madden 11, why did I get this platinum? <laughs> There's almost always something about a completion run that leaves me wondering if I would have enjoyed the game more had I just stopped after initially beating it. To complete a game, players often have to engage with it in a way that is different from what most likely convinced them to try to complete it in the first place. It goes from being a video game to being a checklist, and while I do end up playing it for longer, I rarely get more value from that extra time. The reality is, most titles aren't designed around being completed, and yeah, they shouldn't be. Completionists make up a tiny percentage of players, and given that most people who start a game don't even finish it, putting a ton of focus on making a title that is enjoyable to 100% is low on the priority list. With that all said, every game on Xbox and PlayStation is required to have achievements, and at this point, most titles on Steam have them as well. So regardless of whether or not developers really want to, they have to put some thought into the completion criteria of their game. And depending on how they approach this, the choices they make could inadvertently end up wasting a ton of time for players who choose to complete it. As is customary for Rasputin videos like this, I imagine a handful of you are saying, if you don't like completing games, then just don't do it. And that's fair, but it doesn't take into consideration that I have a lizard brain that tricks me into thinking it would be a good idea to get all the achievements in games I like, despite me knowing that it never turns out well. So with all that in mind, I wanted to examine what goes into games that are actually worthwhile to complete. So to get a fuller picture, I reached out to a handful of developers, as well as someone who has 100% in more titles than anyone else on the planet, probably Gerard the Completionist Khalil. And I found in all of the conversations I had that the heart of making completion enjoyable starts with finding ways to connect the journey to the reward. That to me is the most important part is, one, how cohesively the piece is from start to finish, and two, with completion in mind and completion criteria outlined, is it worth that extra investment, that extra polish, that extra time to get to that, you know, golden pot at the end of the rainbow? With certain tasks, being rewarded with just an achievement isn't enough. When titles have me doing things like gathering collectibles for the sake of gathering collectibles, I almost always either end up resenting the game for wasting my time or quit trying to complete it. In order for me to feel like my time is being well spent, I want some sort of reward, preferably one that impacts gameplay in a meaningful way. A series that is pretty bad about this is Uncharted. For example, in Lost Legacy, there's a section called the Western Gates. It's a non-linear area that allows players to explore at their own pace, and there's an optional quest to collect 11 tokens that are used to fill up a mysterious wall. The reward for getting all of them is a bracelet that alerts the player when other treasure is nearby. As the Uncharted series doesn't have any sort of permanent upgrades, I get this is about as good of a reward as I should have expected, but I still somehow felt let down by it. Yes, it does make it easier to get all the collectibles, but after spending a few hours roaming the western gates to complete the side quest, the last thing I wanted to do was scour the area again just to clean up the treasures I had missed. Knowing that this kind of reward would be the most useful thing I'd get in return for finding every secret, it didn't feel worthwhile and made me question why these kinds of collectibles were in the game at all because they really just felt like a meaningless task to pad out my playtime. The best way to help curb this sort of feeling is by providing meaningful rewards throughout the process. Take Ori and the Will of the Wisps. The various collectibles spread throughout the map are used to either upgrade Ori in the form of increasing health, energy, and abilities, or rebuild the Wellspring Glades, which changes how the area looks, unlocks side quests and pathways to other areas, and almost always gives the player one of the upgrades for Ori as well. On top of that, as the game gets progressively harder, the best way to get past 
difficult areas, aside from just getting good, is to find more upgrades, meaning they're always on the player's mind. When you design the game in such a way that every, every little trip you take off the beaten path gives you something beneficial for your, your main objective, uh, you, you almost turn everybody into a little bit of a completionist, I think. By tying character progression to exploration and discovery, it not only makes it more likely that players will want to search every nook and cranny of a map, but it also leads to them feeling more satisfied for putting in the time to do so than they would have had they just gotten the thumbs up. I think collectibles should always reward the player in some way, and it doesn't need to be an upgrade, but it should be more than just a treasure you can look at in the menus. With all that said, I do want to clarify that while this kind of approach makes completion more enjoyable, I don't necessarily think it is always the right design choice. For example, take Brown of the Wild. One of the major collectibles in the game are Korok Seeds, which are densely packed across Hyrule, making it nearly impossible to not stumble upon some secret with every step Link takes. This causes the world to feel full, and encourages players to explore anywhere that seems interesting, as it not only will lead to a fun little puzzle, but also has the useful reward of being able to unlock more inventory slots. The thing is, there are 900 of them, which is far too many to collect. And that's because they're not meant to all be collected. There are so many of them because the developers wanted players to constantly encounter these little moments of mystery no matter where they went. And by having so many Korok seeds, they ensured that would happen. This choice makes 100%ing Breath of the Wild a maddening experience. But I don't think it was the wrong choice, because had they scaled back the number of Korok seeds, the world would have far less magic to it. In order to make the experience better for the average player, they made it worse for completionists which I think is fair. Nintendo doesn't have achievements, but I've been wondering if they did whether or not collecting every Korok seed would be one or not. Given that the reward for getting them all is a golden piece of shit, I assume the devs don't think it's worthwhile to gather them all. So I would guess that they wouldn't have it be one, because including it as an achievement might encourage more players to do it, which most likely would lead to a lot more people leaving Breath of the Wild with negative feelings. Obviously, the argument could be made that excluding an achievement like that would technically not be completing the game. And and that ties into another thing that came up in all the conversations I had, which is that when it comes to creating completion criteria for trophies and achievements, it shouldn't be about having players experience all of the content. It should be about encouraging them to interact with it in interesting ways. We'll come up with a bunch of ideas based on what we think will be cool with the feats. It's more pointing out a feature of the game that we want players to see that's weird. So when you read the feats list, you're like, what? I didn't even know that was there. The best achievements give players a reason to keep playing beyond just wanting to check things off a list. They get people to approach things from a different angle by promoting playstyles that the developers think are worth trying. When done right, it not only makes the process of completing a game more engaging, but it also gives players a new appreciation for how it can be played. For example, a few of the achievements in Hades got me to experiment with various keepsakes, which called for me to approach rooms in dramatically different ways than I had before, whether that be avoiding enemies at all costs as to not take any damage, or going balls to the walls to clear a room as quickly as possible. This actually led to me discovering my favorite build, that being equipping the plume feather and fists so that I could get to a stupidly high dodge percentage and make Hades look like an idiot. Fuck you, dad. <laughs> Furthermore, an achievement in Shovel Knight pushed me to become a pseudo speedrunner, and I started to look at what I originally thought was a slow-paced platformer through an entirely new lens, and the trophies in Bloodborne actually convinced me to do the Chalice Dungeons, which turned out to be some of my favorite late-game content. Of course, achievements are a double-edged sword. While their ability to encourage players to engage in certain behaviors can lead to positive experiences, it can also push players to engage with some of the most uninteresting and tedious aspects of a game if done poorly. So yeah, it's like not giving the player the right amount of control, breaking the spirit of the game, being too homogenous, being too much of a time or skill commitment. And it's like, these are all really subjective things, which I think kind of just shows that this is an interesting part of design. This is not just a afterthought that a lot of people maybe consider it is. It's this aspect of giving a player a full meal. And like, sometimes that's not articulated well. With achievements, there are a lot of these little traps that many developers fall into, and these end up getting players to chase challenges that they don't have much control over, taking away any real sense of accomplishment that comes from completing them. I think some of the things that like we, we avoid is like anything that's, that's based on randomness. We want the player to feel like it's attainable and understandable from the beginning. It's not something that's just like, find the red thing. 
There's an achievement in Dark Souls called Knight's Honor, and it asks players to acquire all the rare weapons in the game. This calls for them to do multiple playthroughs in order to collect boss souls so that they can make the various weapons. And that part is perfectly fine. Each New Game Plus gets a little more challenging, and it's nice to revisit bosses once you've gotten good. The issue with this achievement comes from weapons that can only be acquired from random drops. So to get it, players need to grind certain areas and hope that they get lucky. This isn't fun. And I know this because I spent over eight hours in the Duke's archives killing the same three channelers over and over, praying for that 1% drop to come before I ran out of brain cells. Once I got it, I didn't feel like I had experienced more of the game, and I wasn't particularly proud that I had finally gotten the drop. I mostly just felt dumb for wasting my time. One of the biggest complications with achievements is that due to them being relatively new to the video game landscape, there is no real consensus on who they should be tailored towards. I imagine a lot of people would say that they should be made for completionists who want to get recognition for doing every challenge a game has to offer, no matter how tedious. I would argue that they shouldn't be. I have no data to back up what I'm about to say, so take it with all the salt you have, but from what I've seen, the vast majority of people who get 100% of the achievements or trophies in a title aren't all that concerned about engaging with every aspect of a game. Instead, they just want to extend their time with it in a meaningful way while still having some sort of definitive stopping point and getting recognition for the extra effort. Alternatively, some people just want a really high gamer score, so they're mostly just concerned with big number getting bigger. But I think the same ideas apply. Achievements provide developers with the opportunity to outline what they believe is worthwhile for players to complete. And having curated completion criteria that doesn't simply just ask players to do everything, but instead directs them towards all of the best things is what I think developers should strive to do. Admittedly, this is a lofty goal that skews towards my personal preferences. I'd wager a guess that most traditional completionists would prefer for achievements to reflect the full scope of a game, which is fair. I just think that there's a camp of people who want more out of a title than just finishing it, but also have no interest in doing menial tasks that don't reflect what makes the game great in the first place. I do want to make it clear that when it comes to me not enjoying the process of completing games, I recognize that I am part of the problem. It takes a certain kind of person and approach to enjoy 100%ing titles, and through talking to Gerard specifically, I realize that one of my biggest issues comes from how I normally go about completing games. With the vast majority of them, I only decided to do everything after beating the main story, which made it so the achievement cleanup felt separate from the core of the game. I would do tasks without a whole lot of rhyme or reason, and inevitably be unsatisfied when my final moment with a game was grabbing a note that I had missed earlier. It felt like a checklist because I made it one, instead of finding a way to have the journey of completing a game be a narrative in and of itself. So to me, the idea of how you approach a game and completing it is a narrative in itself. So if you are the kind of person that's like, I want to be the maximum level character by the end of the game, you have to plan in advance how that goes. That narrative process of building out those things is so much more fascinating to me than the prospects of just getting to the end of the game and then thinking about starting to complete it. This sort of approach, where conscious thought goes into the order and strategy behind completing a game, leads to a far more satisfying result than just going for it. In the spirit of experiencing my own narrative of completion, a few months back, I decided to play and complete Hades. I put a lot of thought in how to approach each achievement, and I did what I could to structure my playthrough in a way that ended on the most exciting note, which was doing a 16 heat run. And I know that some of you probably think that a 16 heat run isn't that impressive, but you know, please give me some credit. I need more validation. <laughs> I think the nature of Hades being a roguelike helped mitigate some of the typical obstacles I bump into when completing games, as the whole point is to play it over and over. But I also think planning out the most interesting ways to get through the achievements made the process more engaging. At no point did I feel like I was cleaning things up. It was all part of the process. It's one of the few games that I've completed where I walked away appreciating it more because I completed it. I don't think this approach works for every title, but I do think it helps. With that said, Said, for it to work, players need to either go into a game planning to complete it or decide pretty early on that they'd like to, and personally, I don't have the time, patience, or interest to do that. I hope as time goes on, developers continue to shift how they look at achievements, and instead of basing them 
around aspects that really aren't meant to be completed. They look at ways to highlight what makes a game good and get players to do more of it. While I don't complete nearly as many games these days as I used to, I do find myself getting pulled into doing it about once a year. And it almost always ends up the same way as the rest, with me never wanting to think about it again despite adoring it. So for now, all I can do is try to ignore the voice in my head that keeps telling me to complete any game I have an emotional connection to, and then pray that when it eventually does convince me to go for that 100%, whatever game I'm playing is actually worth completing. And speaking of things being worth it, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, Raycon. You can tell I'm very good at transitions. Look, it's current year, and frankly, you deserve some wireless earbuds. At this point, you've undone too many tangles and had them ripped out of your ears too many times by getting a cord snagged on a doorknob to not look into them. I've had Raycons for about a year now, and I use them every day as I like to listen to podcasts while doing stuff around the apartment. Most recently, I've been busting through the Bright Sessions, which is quite good, by the way. Their latest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are awesome. They have six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, lots and lots of bass, and a more compact design that gives a nice noise isolating fit. They also come in a lot of cool colors so you can look stylish while wearing them. And if you click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash resbutin, you can get 15% off your order. They also have a 45 day free return policy, so you have the opportunity to test them out and be sure they're the right fit for you. Wireless earbuds are great to have and I've enjoyed my Raycons a lot, so if you're looking for a solid pair, check them out. Anyway, thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring this video. For all of you still watching, did you like the twist at the end of Sixth Sense? Like, it's dramatic, I guess, but also it makes a lot of stuff in the movie not really make sense. You know? I don't know. Uh, I guess have a good day and or night, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.